Log entry number 726. This is the story of a journey among the stars. An intergalactic adventure so astounding that even now, as the great trauma draws to its close, I find it difficult to believe it actually happened. But the evidence is there. What we have all been through was no bad dream, nor the figment of some crazy imagination. Even now we cannot survive, except by the intervention of a miracle. We could still be pursued, attacked, and totally destroyed. And even if we escape our pursuers, we haven't enough air or food to last the long journey home. When at last we do come within the influence of the gravitational field of the Earth, our vessel will automatically go into orbit round it. At some time, the ship must be sighted, boarded and salvaged, but none of us will be alive. The craft that is now our home will by then be our flying tomb. So, for the record, I intend to set down a full account of the amazing things that have befallen us. It all began many Earth years ago, during the summer, the northern summer of 2010. Or maybe that is still in the future. I cannot be sure. Even time seems to have slipped out of joint. Zero minus thirty, twenty-nine, twenty-eight, twenty-seven, twenty-six... Anyhow, forward or backward, during the summer of the year 2010 A.D., we, that is, Space Commodore Saxon Berry, astronautical engineer Lodric Saint-Cyr, Second Communications Officer Lemuel Chipper Barnett, and I, Professor Magnus, were setting off on what we thought was a regular, routine flight to the moon. We have taken off. present Space Force, an intergalactic encounter starring Barry Foster, Nigel Stock, Nicky Henson and Tony Osobo. Episode 1, The Voice from Nowhere. Achieved escape velocity, lunar trajectory established, you're on your own. Have a good trip. Thank you, Control. We'll call you later. OK, we'll begin flight checks. Loderick, you go below and check motors. Right. I'll get some food. I'm virtually a passenger on this trip, so I might as well earn my keep. Oh, good, sir. Tend to the navigation readout, Chip. Doing it. Excuse me, Magnus. Yes, Loderick. Can you give me a hand with this helmet? I can't lock it. Oh. How long have you had this? Ever since I came on the moon run. It's well nigh worn out. <laughs> like everything else on this old tub. Perhaps I should indent for a new one. No need. Space Force will be supplying you with a completely new rig out. There. How's that? Fine. Communication all right? Loud and clear. I'll open the lock for you. Thank you. Won't be long. Don't get lost down there. Trouble with Lodrick is he's space struck. What's that? Well, crazy on stars, astronomy and all that. Spends hours in the observation dome gazing at the sky. I can hear you. Well, it's true, isn't it? I would have thought stargazing a perfectly normal pastime for an astronaut. Well, depends, doesn't it? What do you mean? Chipper, how about that readout? Just doing it, Saxon. I'll cover the radiation check. Meanwhile, you transmit the first flight report for control. Right. Hello, control. Freighter 9 calling Earth control. Hello, Freighter 9, receiving you loud and clear. Here's the first navigation readout for flight number 024, April 9th, 2010. Zero hours, five minutes, universal time. We are spaceborne. Speed 30,000.72. Estimated time of arrival, three days, 19 hours and 42 minutes. Flight information received. Your landing point will be given in due course. Transmission navigation report completed. Good. Magnus has prepared some refreshment. Let's relax. It's easier said than done. I'm too worked up. What will it be like? This space force. And the new ship. Have you seen it? Oh, it's large. Very large. 
The crew's quarters are very spacious. Well, comparatively. Better than this old crock, I bet. Oh, infinitely. Freight ships were never built for comfort. You can say that again. A couple of trips on this run soon knocked all romantic notions of space travel out of me. <laughs> Not much romance in dumping atomic waste on the moon. Sometimes I feel I know more than a universal flying dustman. And flying dust bin just about describes this old crate. Our well, space force will be different. Latest and best equipment. Most powerful motors ever designed. Enough punch to send us to the end of the solar system and back. We should live that long. But it'll be exciting work. Exploration of new moons and planets. Is this a deep probe? Yes. How far? Well, we'll know when we're briefed, after we've touched down on moon base. Why all the secrecy? I didn't plan the trip. I've merely been appointed to command it. What do we let ourselves in for? Well, it must be better than dumping rubbish on the moon. Hello, moon of Freighter 9. Flight number 024, Earth Control calling. Hello. Chipper, you wanted. So I hear. Hello, Earth Control, Freighter 9, Flight 024, receiving Hello, you over. Flight 024, Earth Control mm -hmm. calling. Will you answer, please? What do you think I'm doing? You gone deaf or something? I repeat. Freighter 9, Flight 024, what can we do Freighter for you? Flight 9, Flight 024, come in, please. They're not hearing me. They must be. Flight 024, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Flight Hello, zero Control. Two. We're receiving you loud and clear. Something's wrong with their receiver. Or our transmitter. But we spoke to control right after takeoff. Hello, Freighter 9. Try Lunar Control. Hello, Luna. Freighter 9, flight 024, calling Lunar Control. Need your assistance. Come in, please. If we establish contact. Hello, Earth Control. Luna calling. Yeah. Now, Luna thinks we're Earth. Listen, Hello, listen. Luna. We have lost contact with Freighter 9. Can you help? Hello, Luna. Hello, Earth. This is Freighter 9. We monitor we... your contact with Freighter 9 immediately after takeoff. Reception was good then. Well, it's not their receivers. Must be our transmitter. Keep listening, watch, Luna. We'll do the same. We'll call you in a few minutes. Chipper, you ground tested this equipment before takeoff. Of course I did. Then what do you think could be wrong? Don't know. We're pumping out bags of power. It's as if we've no antenna. Oh, that's it. A fault with the antenna. What? Probably hasn't emerged, got stuck. Oh. It's happened before. Then how did you raise control after takeoff? Well, we were so near to Earth, they'd have picked us up if we'd been transmitting on a length of string. Can you check the aerial now, from in here? Well, according to the ammeter, the aerial's working. Lodrick. Yes? Go to the forehead televiewer. See if the antenna's in place. No good. Why not? Televiewer's vision is blocked by the curve of the ship. Antenna can't be seen from inside. Not even from the observation dome? No. Then somebody will have to go out and inspect it. No contact with control means no automatic navigation. No progress reports, no assisted landing procedure, nothing. We'd have to manhandle the ship. Somebody must go outside, then. Put your suit on. Yes. Me? Your electronics and communications officer. Yes, I'll go. No, Lodrick, this is Chipper's job. But I've, I've never been outside. Not out there, in space. All astronauts are trained for it. Yes, but how many of them ever have to do it? Except in an emergency. This is an emergency. If there's something wrong with the antenna, it's got to be fixed. I suppose so. I'll help you with your suit. Oh, thanks, Lodric. That's very generous. Remember, Chipper, it's perfectly safe. Just make sure your safety line is secure. Thanks for the encouragement. Now, if the antenna needs repair and you want help, Lodric or I will join you, but don't call us out unless it's essential. Oh, great. Now lock your helmet. How's communication? Loud and clear. All right. Open the airlock. Good luck, Chipper. Take it slowly now. You sure you wouldn't like me to go with him, Saxon? If he needs you, he'll ask. Yes, sir. How is it, Chipper? Okay. You can start pumping the air out. Space suit inflating. That's it? Everything okay? Yes. Have safety line, torch. You can open a cage and let me out. Don't move a step until the line is secured. Doing it. Done. Away you go then. Lodric, stand by the forward televiewer. See if you can follow his progress. Right. What a sight. What is? The Earth. All silver and blue and so big. I'm sure you've seen that before. Never so close and not natural like this. Can you see the antenna? Not yet. I need to move forward. Well, gently does it. Don't push too hard. You'll go drifting off. Yeah, yeah. Don't scare me. Ah, there it is. Well? Sticking out in front like the snout of a swordfish, just as it should be. Chipper now in view. 
Moving forward. Uh -huh. Can you get close? Yes. Then take a good look at it. Right. Can you still see him, Ludwig? Just disappearing around the ship's nose. Hello, Saxon. Yes, Chip. Everything appears to be in order. No reason why it shouldn't work. Can you carry out any kind of test? Well, not really, but you can. What can we do? Wait until I've moved back a couple of feet. Now, switch on the transmitter. How's that? What does the aerial ammeter read? Nine. No reason why it shouldn't be working. Hello, Earth. Luna Freighter 9 calling. Hello. Hello, Saxon. Yes, I can hear you. What did you say? I said, yes, I can hear you. No, no, before that, Epsi, uh, Epsilon or something. Epsilon? Yes. I said nothing about Epsilon. There it is again. I don't hear anything. Do you, Magnus? No. Roderick? No. None of us hear anything. But you must. And that, well, music. Music? Well, a, a, a sort of music. Oh, blimey. What is it? Oh, oh I don't like this. Chipper! I'm coming back in. Oh, oh. Help. Chipper! Chipper, can you hear me? Hello, Luna It's Earth Control at last. They've heard us. You left the transmitter on. Hello, Earth Control. Freighter 9, flight 024. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Where have you been? Having a little trouble right now. What kind of trouble? That's what we're trying to find out. Electrical or mechanical? Listen, we'll call you back. Chipper! Roger. Chipper! I think he must have passed out. I'll have to go and fetch him back. Be careful. Prepare the airlock while I get my suit on. Your landing point will be Area 17 in the Mare Serenatus near the crater vessel. Lunar latitude 22.75 degrees north and lunar longitude 18.32 degrees east. Hope Communication Officer Barnett has come to no serious harm. Well, he's still unconscious. They'll give you a routine call in two hours. Roger. Transmission to Earth Control completed. Thanks, Ludwig. Oh, he's coming round. Hand me that drink. Thanks. Oh, where am I? Don't worry. You're perfectly safe inside the ship. I thought I was outside. I was out there inspecting the antenna. That's right. Now, take a sip of this. And then that weird music and that voice. Yeah, we heard no voice, nor music. Well, I did. And pretty horrible it was, too. It seemed to be right inside my head, frightening the life out of me. Take it easy. And it, it kept saying Epsilon. Epsilon um, Solar, that's it. Epsilon Solar. What's Epsilon? It's the fifth letter of the ancient Greek alphabet. So what would Epsilon Solar mean? <sighs> Very little. It, it makes no sense. Then why should somebody keep repeating now it? Now listen, Chipper. You've had a bad experience. I know that. We believe you received an electric shock from the antenna when you asked me to switch on the transmitter. But I moved away, especially to avoid that. It seems you didn't move far enough. Your mind was playing you tricks. While you were in a state of semi-consciousness, you interpreted our voices coming over the intercom as something else. Now, do you remember drifting off to the end of your safety line? No. Saxon had to haul you in. You've been out cold until a few moments ago. None of you heard anything? No. No music? No. Or voices? No. Then I suppose you all think I imagined it. Seems like it. Now, why don't you lie still and let that drink take effect? In an hour or two, you'll feel fine. Lunar Freighter 9, Flight 024, calling Lunar Control. Hello, Flight 024. You're loud and clear. Routine report number 27, flight number 024. Time since takeoff, two days, 13 hours, 54 minutes UT. All well here. Their normal landing procedure will be in 10 hours, 50 minutes from now. 
Retrograde motors will be fired and landing speed controlled by us. Am I understood? Normal landing procedure beginning in 10 hours, 15 minutes from now. Landing point 17 near Crater Bessel? Correct. We'll carry out final inspection of ship and cargo and call again two hours before landing time. Roger, and good luck. Flight report transmission completed. Good. 10 hours to landing procedure. Plenty of time to carry out routine inspections. I'd like to come with you, if I won't be in the way. Uh, nothing much to see, Magnus, but you're welcome. Just put your helmet on. Oh, thanks. And you two can take it easy for a bit. I'd like to go into the observation dome for a while. Certainly. Enjoy your stargazing. Come on, Magnus. Let's get below. You staying here then, Chipper? While you're stargazing, I shall indulge a little TV gazing. I brought three new videos this trip, and this is the first chance I've had to see even one of them. Oh, uh, not old Western films. You like stars, I like old Westerns. Didn't you bring anything this time? Yes, I did. Here. What's that? It's a Cassegrainian. Very rare. 18th century. It's like a telescope Nelson held to his blind eye. What would you do with a thing like that? It was used for some serious work in its day. But not at sea. No, it's the wrong kind of instrument for that. This is an astronomical instrument. Wouldn't show much, would it? Telescope that size. Oh, I admit it's only a three-inch mirror. Well, not a mirror, really. It's highly polished metal. But it worked very well when I tried it down on Earth. Where'd you get it? I picked it up at an auction. Uh... I expect it to perform even better up here, outside the Earth's atmosphere. How many of these things you've got now? Seventeen. All ages and sizes. But mostly 19th century. This is the oldest. You're dying to try it out. <laughs> is there room for it in the observation dome? Just. We'll have a good time. You too. See you later. Enjoy your westerns. Not off. I'll have that then. The Magnificent Seven. That'll do for a start. Ah, westerns beat space fiction any day. Oh, that's... What's that? Oh. oh, no, it's here again. What? Oh, oh. Saxon. Magnus. Help. 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 Good grief, what a mess. Looks bad. Get your helmet off, quick. Loverick, when you've got your helmet off, get the first aid box. Yes, sir. Hey, Chipper, come on, wake up. The TV, it's completely wrecked. Bits floating all over the place. Here you are. Thanks, Loverick. Now call up Lunar and Earth Controls, make sure we're still in contact. Right. Oh, he's coming round. Oh, Magnus, where'd you come from? What are you doing? Wiping the blood away. Blood? You've a nasty cut above the left eye. What happened, Chipper? The TV blew up in my face. I can see that, but how? What caused it? I can't say. I just put the video cassette on, expecting a normal Western with a few gunfights. It looks as though you had them. But instead, I got this weird noise. The same sound I heard outside. A terrible penetrating sound and someone, a, a woman, screaming about... Epsilon, atoms and DNA. Are you sure you put the right cassette on? Yes, look for yourself. Was the woman in the picture? I don't know. The picture broke up, all lines and zigzags, but the music and her voice were there. It was overwhelming. Then the screen shattered. Next thing I remember is looking up at you. Here, I drink this. Magnus, come over to the navigation table, will you? Chipper, you stay where you are. Don't move. Well, it's certainly not his imagination this time. A bit of the TV floating all around the cabin is real enough. First the antenna doesn't function, then the video machine blows itself up, and both times Chipper, who happens to be close to both, is completely knocked out. But first he hears strange music, and stranger voices, or so he says. What was he said he heard? Epsilon Solar. The, the, the height of human beings... Atomic numbers for hydrogen and carbon. And the skinny triangle. Among other things. Well, somewhere I've come across that same odd list before. Oh? When? Oh, years ago. When I was a student. University? No, uh, no, after that. At the School of Astronautic Science. I took a special course in extraterrestrial physics. Well, how does that have any bearing on Chipper's old western wrecking the TV? Give me a little time. I might answer that. Uh... Could I call Earth Control and ask them to put me in touch with the school? Of course. Meanwhile, Ludwig and I will start tidying the place up. It looks as though all hell's broken loose in here. 
If my hunch is right, it probably has. What? Do you have a headpiece I can use? I wouldn't like Chipper to hear what I'm saying. Oh. Yes, just plug your intercom into the receiver. It'll automatically cut out the loudspeaker. Ah. Thanks. Well, did you get what you wanted? Is Chipper awake? Fully. I'll need to talk to him. Go ahead. How are you feeling, Chipper? Oh, all right. Could you answer a few questions? Okay. That voice, that woman's voice you heard on the videotape, what did it say exactly? Oh, I can't remember exactly, but it was something about Epsilon Solar. Thank you for your message. The atomic numbers of various chemicals, the height of man, population of the Earth, and the skinny triangle, whatever that is. She finished up with, hear this. But as the TV blew up at that point, I didn't hear anything. Now think. Think carefully. Have you ever been told or read about Arecibo? Are you? No, not who. It. Arecibo's a telescope. Oh, Lodrick's the one that knows about telescopes, don't you, Lodrick? I collect old brass optical no, telescopes. No, 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 no. This is a radio telescope, actually. Oh. A chipper. You've never knowingly heard or read about the Arecibo? Or perhaps seen a picture of it sometime? No, I'm a simple communications officer. Radio astronomy is out of my field. What's this got to do with the TV blowing up? The Arecibo was engaged in highly important work. It was used to beam messages into space, deep space, in the hope that if the signals were ever picked up, they would be acknowledged. We'd then have proof of other beings inhabiting the universe besides ourselves. But how do you send a message to people you don't know, who don't speak your language? And whose civilizations could be so different they couldn't make sense of what you're saying, even if they heard the signal. The Arecibo operators had thought of that. They figured that the same physical laws must apply right through the universe. The conditions that produce life on Earth would produce life on any other planet. And mathematical laws, the laws of chemistry, they must be the same throughout all creation. Any other beings advanced enough to have radio receivers must be as aware of the natural universal laws as we are. So, the kind of signals sent contains simple chemical and mathematical formulae. Descriptions of human beings and the solar system. And the skinny triangle. The great skinny triangle, with a very small baseline and one extremely small angle. It enabled Earth-bound astronomers to measure the diameter of planets and even the distance of certain stars. I still don't see the connection between all that and the Magnificent Seven. That voice you picked up, Chipper, was repeating the message sent out by Arecibo and... And I picked it up. No. Not the message. The reply. Hey, Where from? Well, the message was directed towards the constellation Centaurus. Oh, that seems too fantastic to be true. Arecibo's main target was the star Alpha Centauri. That's the closest star to our solar system. Four and a half light years away. In other words, a spaceship travelling non-stop at the speed of light would take four and a half years to reach it. Exactly the time it would take a radio message. And four and a half years to get back the reply. Is that what all that row was? A reply to Arecibo's message to outer space? Most likely, yes. Then what we need is for Arecibo to reply to their reply. It's not as simple as that. The Arecibo was broken up for scrap. But their message? You said Arecibo sent it? Yes, but more than 30 years ago. Way back in the 1970s. 1970s? And we've only just heard? After more than 30 years? Yes. From a distant star? Probably. Now, wait a minute, Magnus. Are you suggesting that intelligent beings more than 15 light years away from Earth are trying to contact us? I think they've done it. But that voice, so loud, and in English, it, it could have been coming from the moon or the Earth. Exactly. You mean they are on the moon? Maybe not on the moon, but close, very close. I believe, gentlemen, that we are on the brink of a space-age breakthrough. What? Personal contact with extraterrestrial beings. D-Set B has suspected it for some time. Who? D-Set B. 
Department for the Search of Extraterrestrial Beings. Never heard of them. Good. They have to keep their work secret. Otherwise, their discoveries might cause panic on a massive scale. <laughs> then why are you telling us? Because you are now part of the organization, Lodrick. It's very spearhead. But Who do you think has planned Space Force and prepared its program of operation and your training? You are part of this D-Set B. Yes. And that's why you're on this trip. My brief is to investigate those radio signals, find out who or what is sending them. But where are they coming from? Somewhere in the region of Jupiter, we think. Jupiter? Oh, that's less than a light hour away. How are we supposed to carry out this investigation? We go there. You can't be serious. There's no other way. What about space probes and manned ships? Four have already been sent to monitor the signals and pinpoint the place they're radiating from. So? Everyone has been lost. What? As soon as they get within monitoring distance of Jupiter, they drop dead. All electronic gear fails. They just keep sailing round Jupiter like a space fleet of Marie Celeste's. I see. Well, how soon are we expected to leave? In a month or so. Is that all? Enough time to get you used to the new ship and to handling the new equipment. Why do we start training? As soon as we've touched down on the moon. Well, that's just a few hours. Oh, can I talk to Lunar Control? I want to be sure somebody will meet us. Yeah, Lunar Conveyance meets every ship, carries all personnel to base. Not this crew. We don't go to base. Oh? We go straight to the Space Force takeoff pad. I didn't know there was one. Yes. And a temporary training section and living quarters have been built nearby. <laughs> They've thought of everything. I hope so. If they haven't, then heaven help us. A few hours later, the ship was turned over and we landed. A personnel conveyor met us at the touchdown pad, and then, after we'd climbed aboard, began to whine and bump its way across the surface of the Mare Serenitatis. The what? Mare Serenitatis. What does that mean? The Sea of Serenity. The Calm Sea. You must be kidding. The name was given by the old astronomers. They thought the dark areas of the moon were seas, and that's what they called them. Only they used Latin. Well, if it's the Calm Sea... Why are we bumping about so much? Once it was a sea of hot liquid. When it cooled down, it solidified into this undulating bed of lava. It's also strewn with rocks and boulders. Oh, you're telling me. And pitted with little craters. There she is. Mm -hmm. Where? Straight ahead. Just showing over the horizon. Oh, yeah. That's the ship. The Space Force. The training period was short but intensive. First, we learned to adapt to low gravity and total weightlessness. Then we learned to use the magnetic hand grips and overshoes. These would enable us to walk on the inside or outside surfaces of the ship like human flies. We were also instructed to use electric rotary tools so that it was the tools that spun and not ourselves. And finally, we familiarized ourselves with the portable life support units which we carried on our backs. At last came the time, near the end of the course and the long lunar day, equal to 14 days on Earth, when we were to put our training to a practical test. This is where we get out? That's right. We now find your own way back on foot. You can see the mountains over to the northwest, but don't try to go over them. Uh, go round. Right. A desperate-looking place. Your position and all you say will be monitored by control. In the case of extreme emergency, they will send me out to find you. <laughs> I'm sure there'll be no need of that. Then I'll get back. Good luck. Thanks. Don't fall into any craters. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll start. Uh, Chipper and Lodrick, you go down into the crater and up the other side, right? Okay. We'll go round the rim. Now, keep inside of us and don't walk into any shadows. The sudden change from a high to very low temperature may upset the thermostatic system in your pressure suit. Is that clear? Yes. Good. Don't hurry and keep in touch. See you on the other side, then. Yeah. Come on, Chipper. Remember what they told us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Short steps and bending forward. Yeah, it's not so easy going downhill. Come on, Magnus. They don't have so far to go as us. But at least our walk is on the level. Yeah. How wide did they say this crater is? About uh, six miles. Yeah. Oh, Chipper and Lodrick must have reached the middle by now. Hello, Lodrick. Receiving you. 
Yeah, we can hear you, but we can't see you anymore. It's not surprising with this. What is it? I've fallen over. What? But I'm all right. Don't move. Don't move. Stay where you are. Chipper will help you up. Chipper. Chipper. Why doesn't he answer? Lordrick? Yes. Can you see him? Can't see anything except the sky. I'm flat on my back. Chipper. Chipper. I'd better try to get up without him. No, no, wait. You might puncture your suit. I'm helpless like this. We'll come down. Lodrick, it's Saxon. Thank goodness you're here. Give me a hand up. Right. Uh, come on. Uh, easy now. Mm. <coughs> there. Uh, yeah, thanks. Now, where was it you last saw Chipper? Behind that rock. Uh, he jumped over it. He what? Has he gone crazy? And where has he got to? Oh, perhaps he's fallen into a small crater. I'll give him one more call. And if there's no response? Well, then we'll have to ask control for a full-scale emergency operation. Hello, Chipper. This is Saxon. Can you hear me? Oh, we'll have to call. Hello, Chipper. Saxon calling Chipper. There you are. At uh, last. What do you mean, at last? I've been calling and calling and never any reply. No sign of Lodrick. I think I've lost him. I'm here. Where are you? Oh, I'm about halfway up the southern slope of the crater. Southern slope? Yes, there he is. On the high terrace. You, you can see the glint of his visor. Chipper, what happened to you? I don't rightly know. He's at least a mile away. Maybe more. How could he have covered all that distance? At last. Quite a climb up this ridge, Chipper. Is it? What the hell were you playing at? Nothing. You know it's against orders to jump over rocks and ass about like a kid on a trampoline. I don't know what came over me. Why didn't you answer my calls? I tried to, but you didn't seem to hear him. When that music came on, I, I couldn't hear anything. It was deafening right inside me. Music? Yes. And a voice? Yes. I thought perhaps I could get out of the range of it if I climbed up to the rim. But the funny thing is, I don't remember climbing up. One minute I was in the depths of the crater with that music in my head, driving me crackers. The next I'm up here on the terrace, all quiet and peaceful, and you're calling me. You were aware of nothing in between? No. I don't think I made it up, do you? Well, I might have done. If you hadn't apparently climbed up here so quickly. How oh, you managed that, I shall never figure out. I wish I knew. All I do know is that that space music had something to do with it. Yeah. Well, the main thing is you're okay. Come on. We'd better get you back to base. What had happened to Chipper? Strange things can happen to spacemen especially after long periods of low or zero gravity conditions. Stomach upsets, headaches, and even hallucinations. Yet an examination by the training center psychologist found him quite normal. And the incident was put behind us when less than 36 hours later, the time arrived for us to take the first step of our momentous journey to the giant planet, Jupiter. Ten. Nine, There she goes, Space falling away. 40,400 miles, 65,000 kilometers per hour. Crew may unfasten safety belts. Yes, we know that. Just pay attention, Chipper. <sighs> this is better. Good, smooth takeoff. Yes, so I should think, ship like this. Quite. Comfortable cabin, too. It needs to be. This little compartment's our home for the next three years. Little? It's the biggest one I've ever flown in. It won't seem so roomy six months from now. You've never been on a really long flight, Chipper. And get pretty grim. 
zero plus 53 Earth days and 12 hours universal time. Ship to Earth distance 48 million miles. Ship to target 449 million. Estimated time distance to Jupiter one year and 115 days. Space Force is about to cross the orbit of Mars. Hear that? We're crossing the Martian line. This calls for a celebration. <laughs> Does that mean we'll get a close look at it? What, the Martian orbit? No, the planet Mars. Right not, Chipper. Oh. Right now, Mars is situated on the other side of the sun. It's nearer to the Earth than we are. How are we going to celebrate? With a proper meal. Fried chicken, strawberries and cream, and a bottle of wine. What? Great. Make a change from concentrated cues. Absolutely. And as fresh as most people could get on Earth. Well, bring it out. Let's celebrate. I'll get it. My turn in the galley. How much of this fresh frozen food have we got? Uh, not much. It's too heavy. Enough for a couple of meals. Oh. Those messages get longer every time. Useful, though. Said as a radio time lag between us and Earth. My last call took 40 minutes to get there and back. It's going to get a sight longer. <sighs> That's what worries me. Yeah. Somehow it makes you feel, I don't know, cut off from everything. Like you're living in your own tiny world with nothing outside to make contact with. God, there's plenty to see outside. Stars by the billion, galaxies by the million, comets, planets. What do you mean there's nothing to see out there? It's just a feeling, that's right, all. Right, Lodrick, Chipper, finish up any work you have that involves the use of any extension, boom, or antenna. Except radio, solar energizers, and televiewer. Hey? Well, didn't you hear? We're about to enter the asteroid belt. Now, when you've finished up your work, we'll close off all pressurized units of the ship and make ready for asteroid emergency. Right. Oh, and from now on, pressure suits will be worn at all times. Oh, now what? Helmets as well? No, but keep them close by. Why all the emergency preparation? Just in case. If we were hit, even by a small rocket, could knock quite a hole in us. The air would escape. Oh, I thought entering the asteroid belt was a time for celebration, like crossing the Martian orbit. Not on this ship. No decent meal, then? No. But once we finish the preparations, we can at least get some rest. All instruments have been retracted, Saxon. Good. You can get some sleep then, Lodric. Thanks. How's Chipper, Magnus? Dead to the world. Mm -hmm. Will be for the next couple of hours. I put a sedative in his drink. Sedative? Why? I'm worried about his health. I think he's developing signs of solipsism syndrome. What's that? He thinks that anything outside his own experience cannot exist. It's not uncommon for people shut up for long periods in confined spaces. But he's been flying between Earth and Moon in confined cabins for years. But never for months at a time. We can expect to be cooped up for three years. And we've spent little more than three months so far. Yes, I see what you mean. What made you suspect something was wrong? The way he's affected by the long waits between radio calls. Having to wait 40 minutes or more for a reply has a frustrating effect on him. Yes, I've noticed. It could get worse. How? Apathy. Diminished power of judgment and then a don't-give-a-damn attitude. Except for things that affect him directly. Personal things like the quality of food. He's also liable to get quite aggressive. Hallucinate, even. Like on the moon, when he said a voice drove him up the slope of the crater? Possibly. He's already complained about the radio time lag. To... What? The asteroid, what? we've been hit. Emergency. We've been hit. Come on, get your helmets on. What about Chipper? He Where, dropped. Where is his helmet? I don't know. What? He could die if we... Spirited behind the video screen. I'll get it. No, no. I'll look after him. You get to your station and turn that alarm off. There. Everybody all right? I'm fine. And me. I've put Chipper's helmet on. Any sign of damage? No. Oh. How's the air pressure? Normal. We don't seem to have lost any. Oh. Does that mean we haven't been holed? Yes. We've been lucky. It must have been a very small asteroid, hardly more than a particle. Well, let's hope we don't meet a larger one. We remained lucky. 
It took us an anxious, worrying five months to pass through the asteroid belt, but we finally emerged unscathed. Much to Chipper's delight, we celebrated with another fresh food dinner, our second in a year. Then, on the 500th day... Chipper. Yeah? Come and look at this. What is it? There, on the screen. Blimey. Isn't that beautiful? Well, I suppose it is, in its way. Something I've dreamed of all my life. What? To see Jupiter in close-up. It looks like a, a glowing jewel resting in black velvet. Look at all those colours. Russet, purple, brown, and the glorious red spot. Well, almost red. Looks like a giant stomach ulcer. <laughs> Chipper, you've got no soul. Why's it got that golden rim round it? Yeah, that's the Jovian atmosphere flowing past it. Like a strong water current past a rock. Is that what it is? <laughs> no. No, Jupiter consists almost totally of gas. Then what causes that thing? The great red spot. Yeah. It's a storm. An everlasting hurricane in the Jovian atmosphere. 30,000 miles long and 7,000 miles wide. You could drop two and a half Earths in there and lose them. No place for holiday. You're right. And here we are, heading straight for it. We shall go round it. Attention, attention, unidentified object ahead, bearing 0.1 degrees, distance 300 miles, and a 300 miles? Sorry, Lodrick, I'll have to have the televiewer. Help yourself. 0.1 degrees, the computer say? Yes. Yes, it's there. 285 miles ahead. Whatever it is, we're gaining on it slowly. Yes, we should be level with it in an hour or so. Keep watch, Magnus. Give me a call when you get a clear view of it. Saxon, we're almost up with it. It's a ship, no doubt about it. Well, it doesn't seem to be carrying any antennae or booms or anything. You'd think they'd have noticed us by now. Perhaps they're lying low. Hey, look at the way she's tumbling over. I'd say she was out of control. Hey, look at that. What? Well, the next time she turns over, look at where the entrance should be. There, see? Good heavens, yes. It is the entrance. But it's open. Well, that, that must mean that nobody's there. They've all left. If they haven't, they're all dead. But who? The ship looks as though it was made on Earth. Maybe some tin pot country operating an expedition on the quiet. Well, it doesn't appear to have been very successful. We'll go over there. You and I. Very well. Ludwig, uh, bring us two personal mobility units. Yes, Magnus. Chipper, prepare the lock to let us out. Right. And then go back to your watch. Sure. Make sure all we say and do is recorded. Roger. Nearly there. Now just drift in. Right. No, 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 not too fast. That's it. Well, this is the only way in. So follow me, Magnus. That's odd. No inner lock. Yeah. Well, how could anyone enter and leave with only one door? They'd lose all their air. Yeah. I think we can walk from here on. Oh, such a small cabin, not even one astronaut could survive in here. And how do you fly this thing? There's no machinery, electronic or mechanical. Not now, there's not. Huh? Well, look at the walls. There was equipment, but it's all been ripped out. Yeah. That explains why there are no antennae outside. They've been ripped off, too. Look at this design. This is an Earth-made ship. Uh -huh. It must be one of the four unmanned probes. And somebody has boarded her and ripped out all her equipment. Out of all our probes, which is why we've heard nothing from them. Can we identify this ship precisely? Let Earth know we found her? Only by the number on her side. OK. Let's get back. Send a full report to control. Well, who could have done it? And why? Uh. And what would they have done if they'd found people in here? We returned to the ship. Saxon made his report on the wreck, and Chipper transmitted it to Earth. The Space Force was boosted back to its old speed, and we continued our journey towards the giant planet. We saw no more wrecks. Then, some 500 million miles and one year, six months and five days after leaving Earth, we came close enough to Jupiter to go into orbit. Day 550, hours. Orbital maneuver will begin in 30 seconds. Final check, Magnus. All systems functioning. Lodric, motor's okay. 
All set. Chipper, television? Okay. Radio? Okay. Thrusters will fire for up to three minutes. We'll change speed and course and then go into orbit round the planet. Orbital maneuver. Thruster motors will fire in 15 seconds. Hey, Oxygen. wait a minute. What's wrong? Somebody's calling us. Hmm? Over the radio. Put the radio on intercom. It's on. Hear it? No. But it's so loud and clear. Oh, there's that music again. Like when we go to the moon. Stop. Wait. Let me out. If I don't get up, the motors are fired. Let me out. Oh, no. It's right inside my head. It's burning. It's burning. I keep calm. Oh, oh no. Excellent. Chipper, Chipper. Speed 46,000. What We're happened? In orbit. The radio heated up and exploded. But I heard that music again and that woman's voice. Oh. You heard it, didn't you? I fed the radio into the intercom so you could all hear. No, Chipper. We heard lots of odd sounds, but no voice. It was as clear as anything. Day 550 times 0559 hours and three. And three what? What else? It stopped. The computer stopped working. Something has put all the radio circuits out of action. It's stupid as radionosphere. We're too close. Control said it would have little effect. <laughs> well, they were wrong, weren't they? What if it upsets the other circuits? The motor monitors, the power supply. Mm. I spoke too soon. Where's the emergency lighting control? It should come on automatically. Yeah, there it is. How about the televiewer? No, that's failed. Everything's gone haywire. We can't navigate the ship blind. We must be able to see out. Well, use the observation dome. Open the lock, Lodrick. Right. Now what? The emergency power's failed. Why's it gone all dark? What's going on? Well, that... That's everything except the gyros. But... Go to your takeoff positions, get your flashlights. I've got mine, but it doesn't work. Nor mine. Well, that's it, then. The television circuits don't function, so we can't see. The radio doesn't work. The computers cease to function. There are no lights. And the air replenisher has stopped. The ship has dropped dead. Like that wreck we saw five days ago. The air supply's running down fast. I'm afraid we only have a few days left. Nobody move or get up. Unless instructed. Who wants to get up? It's pitch dark. What caused the breakdown? Well, perhaps it's the influence of the Jovian magnetosphere. It could have upset all the electrical circuits. Thank goodness we'd completed the orbital maneuver before it happened. Why? Ah, oh, because at least we are on our set course. In a few hours, we'll begin to pull out of the perigee and head out for the furthest point of our orbit. On the way... We'll move out of the magnetosphere, and if I'm right, the circuits will return to life and the ship should be normal again. But if the circuits revive every time we head away from the planet, then they'll die again every time we return. Unless we change our orbit to a much wider, more secular one. But we can't spare the fuel. How long before the power returns, do you think? Oh, we must wait and see. But once we get it back, we can work out when the blackout periods are likely to occur and... Be ready for them. Chipper, what are you doing? I'm not doing anything. Well, that... What was that noise? Mice? This is no time for joking. There it is again. Coming from the main airlock. That sounds as though it's coming from outside. Blimey. There's someone out there. They're trying to get in. They'll be lucky. Why? Oh, get in through the airlock. With no power. They've got as much chance of getting in as we have of getting out. If only we could see outside. It's impossible. Unless... What? Unless Lordrick could open the airlock into the observation dome. How? By hand. But I have to That's work. only permitted in an emergency. This is an emergency. How about it, Lordrick? Do you think you can do it? Total darkness. Why not? You know all the mechanical installations so well. Yes, but there's always the chance that opening the lock will upset the electronic settings. It may not function properly afterwards. Mm. We'll risk that. We'll see what I can do then. If you need any assistance, yell out. Right. I need a few tools. I'll help you find them.
And so, in total darkness, Lodric toiled at the airlock leading into the observation dome. For what seemed an eternity, we lay in the dark and in silence. Meanwhile, the sounds outside ceased. Whoever or whatever had been investigating us had gone away. How are you doing, Ludrick? I'd do a lot better if I could see. I have to do everything by touch. How far have you got? Not very far. I've got the cover to the electrical component off. The mechanical parts... <coughs> God, what's happened? Ludrick! Ludrick! I'm all right. Just got an electric shock. But there's no power in this ship. You can't have... The supplies coming back. Must be out of the magnetic field. Lost. Good. Are you sure you're all right, Ludrick? Yes. Well, take a break. Meanwhile, the rest of us will inspect the ship to see if there's any damage. Has everything been checked? Airlocks, motors, air supply, everything. All in good order, so far as I can tell. Good. All navigation circuits are back to normal. How about you, Chipper? Radio transmitter's working. I sent the message to Earth, like you said. How long before they reply? Well, I sent it 90 minutes ago, attention, so... Attention, attention. Radio call from Earth in 15 seconds. Ah, uh -huh. good. Just time to check the televiewer. Should be okay. I'll try it. There. Lovely picture. The splendor of the heavens in close-up. Thank goodness, everything's returned to normal. Stand by. Radio call from Earth in five seconds. Oh, good. Turn it off! It's hurting my ears! Turn it off, Chipper! Oh, what was that? It's like all hell had broken loose. That was her. The voice I keep hearing. What'd she say? She said, Epsilon Solar, Epsilon Solar, thank you for your message. You heard that? Out of all that chaos? Yes. Well, turn the radio on again, but keep the volume low. And whether it would be best for you to remain in your present orbit or to go into another further from the planet's surface. That's Earth. We cannot give you an immediate answer, but shall reply in half an hour. Please keep a listening watch. So, what's happened to Mrs. Epsilon? If there is one. But you must have heard... No, we didn't. You're the only one who ever hears a voice. We may not hear voices, Saxon, but we do hear all those strange sounds. Well, of course we do. Every time the radio circuits are disturbed, what else would you expect? Well, I'm just a different... Radio call imminent. Radio call imminent. Not already. They said half an hour. It's her again. Let's get that off. And what did she say this time? Same as before. I think it must be a recording which she's played over and over again. But why so loud? Because she's so close. Yes, that's what you said on the moon 500 million miles back. Well, perhaps she's followed us here. Saxon, quick! What is it? There, on the televiewer. Good heavens. It's a ship. A ship? Where? What's its position? At port, 97 degrees. And there's only one? That's all I've seen. Make sure the log is recording all this. I'll go out to the observation and go. Just one ship sailing alongside us. Computer says it's less than a kilometer away. So how big would you say it is? Well, in that case, it's smaller than Space Force. Any windows? Uh, there seems to be a series of portholes around the middle, but no light behind them. And I can't see any kind of door, can you? No. Uh, I wonder if it's just an unmanned probe. Well, you could try to make contact. Go outside? No, over the radio. Uh, did you hear that, Chipper? Yes. Well, can you do it? What frequency can I use? How about the one your friend Mrs. Epsilon comes up on? Uh, the signal's so strong it stretches right across the band, swamps everything. Well, choose a frequency somewhere in the middle and see what happens. What shall I say? Say you are Space Force, 
and ask them what they want. In English? What else? You don't speak Jovian, do you? Oh, all right. Give me a couple of minutes to reach you in a transmitter and I'll give her a call. Uh, I'm coming back into the main cabin. This is Space Force. This is Space Force. Can you hear me? This is... Oh, God! Well, we're certainly getting a response of noises. Can you hear a voice? Of course I can. I always do. Shall I switch it off? Yes, yes. God. What did it say? Almost the same as before. Almost? What was different? Well, instead of saying Epsilon Solar, she said, You are Epsilon Solar. Now, you're sure you didn't get it wrong? I'm certain I didn't. I, I wish you'd just believe me when I... Oh, OK, Chipper. It's, it's just that I've got to be sure about what you're saying. After all, you're the only one... Jackson! Yes, now what? Look, quick. To the left. Light issuing from the ship. Like a door has opened. Magnus, you keep looking with Roderick. I'll go back into the dome. The image is bigger, isn't it? The ship's moved closer, and the angle of view has... Look, look, there, now! The door slid wide open. Can you see it, Saxon? Yes. And the lighted interior? Yes. And two figures? Two figures? Good Lord, yes. They're coming over. The two strange figures drifted over from their ship to ours. We saw them on the televiewer, gradually getting larger as they drew closer. Then they were no longer in view. Saxon, from his more advantageous position in the observation dome, said they were heading for the main outside airlock. And then he lost sight of them and came back into the cabin. Whoever they are, they're human in shape. Are they human in fact? What do they want with us? It must be they who keep sending the radio calls. Who else? Do you think they're Jovians? No. Nobody, nothing could live on Jupiter. From one of his moons? I doubt it. Certainly not the innermost ones. What about the outer moons? Life on one of those could be a possibility. But very unlikely. Where do they come from, then? Listen. Must have been them tapping earlier. What do we do? We should have been armed. You think they're hostile, then? They certainly sound it. They're determined to get in, whether we like it or not. It's getting louder. They're battering the hull. I'm going to open the outer lock. You can't. You let them in. If I don't, they'll damage the ship. This way they might damage. They've stopped. That surprised them. Now what are you going to do? Well, before I can open the inner door, they must enter the airlock, and then the outer door must be closed. They'll think it's some kind of trap. Roderick, go to the observation dome. Tell us what you see. Right. Saxon. Yes, Loderick. They're floating outside, holding off from the ship. I think they're going away. We should be that lucky. Yes. Yes, they're going back to their own ship. Yes, we can see them now on the televiewer. They don't seem to have any means of propulsion. Don't see any. They've gone back inside. Door closed. We scared them off. You think they scared that easily? Well, I can but hope. Well, perhaps they've decided Saxon. that we're not with Yes, Loderick. They're coming out again. Decided to give it another try. One's carrying a box, and they're both... Damn, they've gone out of view. They're heading for the main door. How do they move so fast? I've lost sight of them now, but they must be close. What was that? I think they've entered the lock. Then we've got them. Do we want them? Close the outer door and they're caught. How would that help? They're, they're trying to open the inner door. But the outer one isn't closed. We must shut it then. If they manage to open the inner one, we'll lose all our air. Chipper, close the outer door. <laughs> it won't close. Try again. It's, it's, no, it's no good. It's not working. They could be through any moment. Right, get your spacesuits on. If they get that door open, we'll need them. Did you hear that, Loderick? Yes, on my way. All helmets on. Right. Intercom check. Magnus? Okay, loud and clear. Loderick? Okay. Chipper? Loud and clear. Loud and clear. That's right, that's what I said. What was that, Chipper? I said that's right. That's what I said. What did you say? I said I was receiving you loud and clear, and you repeated it. Loud and clear, you said. Only you said it quietly. I didn't say anything except Chipper. But I distinctly... Chipper. Heard... Huh? Who's that? Who's what? 
But this is no time for asking about. Somebody called my name. Only to check the intercom. No, after that. Everybody keep quiet for a minute. Well? No. No, it's gone. I don't, I don't hear it anymore. Who are you? There you are. She's back. Asking who we are. Who? I don't know who. Somebody. Anybody else hear it? No. Everybody stay quiet. Are you Epsilon Solar? There, as I thought nothing. No, I'm Chipper Barnett, radio operator, second class of Order Space Force. We know that. Where do you come from? We're from Earth, on a mission to Jupiter. What are you talking about? No, don't interrupt him. How long did it take you to reach here? A year and a half. A Jovian year? No, an Earth year, much shorter. By how much? I, I don't know, but I, I know it's shorter. Are you the only one aboard your ship? No. There are four of us. Has he Saxon. gone crazy? He's the captain. Loderick, he's our engineer, and uh, Magnus, he's from D set B, has been sent to observe. Can the rest of your crew be what I'm saying? No, I don't think so. Ask them. Saxon, she wants to know if you can all hear her. Who does? Chipper, if this is some kind of joke. We can't hear anybody, Chipper. No, they, they can only hear me. As we thought. Chipper, are you wearing a translator? A what? Obviously you are not. No, no. You will have to interpret for us. I interpret? Listen to what we say and pass it on to your leader. All right, but who are you? My name is Treya. What kind of armament does your ship carry? Armament? We don't carry any armament. We're a spaceship, not a battleship. No armament of any kind? No, they, they only carry guns in science fiction. Good. Now ask your leader... You mean Saxon? He is the ship's commander. Ask the commander to open this door and let us in. Saxon, did you hear any of that? All we heard was you carrying on a one-sided conversation with nobody. Well, nobody is called Treya, and she says, will you open the airlock inner door and let them in? I see. Tell them we can't open the inner door unless the outer door is closed. Then we have to equalize the air pressure. We can't get you in until the outer door is shut, and it's not working. We understand. Wait. It will close now. Try now, Saxon. You kept it open. We did not wish to be caught inside. Doors shut. Will you let them in now? What guarantee have I that they don't carry arms? They don't sound hostile. Open the door or we will blast it open. Oh. She says if you don't open the door, she'll blast it open. No, no. They, they mustn't harm the ship. I'll open it. But this is insane. We're playing no, into no, their hands. No, no. Don't, don't stand too close together. Just keep calm. Magnus? Yes? Open up. At least seven feet tall. Silver from head to foot. Chipper, tell them to stand over by that table. She wants us all together over there. She's got a gun. <laughs> Move quickly. I told you we're not armed. There's no need for violence. Stand still. If what is going to search the ship. Anybody moving while I'm doing it will be shot. Don't move while they search the ship. So they're not hostile, Chipper. I only said they didn't sound hostile. Tell them we are satisfied there are no weapons. Now remove your helmets. Take your helmets off. What for? I don't know. She's got the gun. Anyway, they're taking theirs off. They've got silver hair. Silver skin. I've never seen anything like it. Here you are, Chipper. These are translators. They must put them in their ear. She wants you to wear these hearing aids. She what? So that you can understand them. Oh, I see. Now we can communicate. She's speaking oh. English. This instrument enables us to talk telepathically. The verbal translation is done in your own head. Why doesn't Chipper need one? He's naturally telepathic. We can reach his mind without a translator. Are people not telepathic where you come from? Some people claim to be, but I never believed them. Till now. Are all people as tall where you come from? Are all people midgets where you come from? We are sorry to have behaved aggressively when we came aboard, but we had to be sure you could not attack us. No arms anywhere on this ship, so you can all relax. How do you come to be in, in this part of the solar system? Our mothership is in orbit on the far side of Jupiter. Mothership? How far on the other side? 490,000 miles. The ship alongside ours, that's not your main vessel. Of course not. How did you find us? We've been aware of you for some weeks. But we thought you were unmanned. We didn't realize the ship had a crew until the outer door opened. Yeah, I opened it. That is why we returned to our craft, to contact our mothership for instructions. And? We were ordered to board you and take over your vessel and take you back for examination. Now, wait a minute. 
We don't know who you are, where you came from, or anything about you. Now is your opportunity. But you can't just step aboard our ship and order us to another part of the system. If Voedica says you go, then you go. Who? Voedica, commander of our mothership. We can't refuse them, Saxon. We have to. We can't spare the fuel we needed to get home. Wrong. You will never be returning home. You, not return. you will come with us. And if we refuse? Our orders are to kill the ship electronically and leave you in it. So take your choice. Put your ship into a new orbit or remain where you are forever. <laughs> I need to discuss the situation with my crew. A few minutes only. Right, everybody over here. Now, take these translators out of your ears. We don't want them to understand what we're saying. No, no. All right? Now, do we obey them or do we resist? I want everybody's opinion. Magnus? The ship and crew are better alive than dead. Besides, this is what we came here for. What is? To find out who's been sending those radio messages and to learn all we can about them. We were never expected to make personal contact. But now that we have, we must take full advantage of it. Even before we know if they're friendly? Which they're not, Magnus. How do you know? They haven't harmed us. Yet. But they will. Unless we can get away. How? We'll... We'll, we'll think of something. We've little time for that. How about you, Chipper? Roderick's panicking. I think they're friendly. A funny way of showing it. How about the gun? Now, how about the threat to leave us on a dead ship to perish? It's all talk. Talk? To persuade us to go with them. They don't mean us any harm. They could have killed us all with that ray pistol, but they chose not to. Better alive on the other side of Jupiter than dead on oh, this. Possibly. But I think we should make at least one effort to get the ship back under our control. How? I have an idea. Don't tell it to Chipper. They can read his thoughts. Yeah. Chipper, you move away. Okay, Chief. Now, what we have to do is this. Well, bearing in mind your threat to kill our ship stone dead and have us entombed in it... Yes. ...we'll willingly comply with your demand and put Space Force into a new orbit. Good. But in order to do that, we must ask both of you to leave our ship. If we leave it, we kill it. Why can't you move it, as ordered? We can. But when the rockets fire, the force is enormous. All crew must be strapped into their takeoff couches. Anyone not doing so is liable to suffer serious injuries. Ifwa will use a couch. Ifwa? She will stay and guard you. Uh, but we don't have a spare couch, that's what I'm saying. Ifwa could suffer a terrible injury. You'll both have to go back to your own ship. Ifwa will stay. There isn't room. Room will be found. <laughs> but One of you will give up your takeoff couch for Ifwa. And where will he go? He will come with me, to my ship. But... but to change speed and course, we need a crew of four. Tell Ifwa what to do. What? In five minutes? That's impossible. No, no, no. You'll have to leave the ship. That's if you are serious about our moving to the far side of Jupiter. One of you will move, and Ifwa will stay. But I've just explained I can't spare anybody, not in a tricky operation like changing orbit. You, your name. Magnus. No, you can't Put on take your pressure it. suit. You will come with me. Now. Commander Saxon will instruct if we're how to crew change of orbit. But you don't know the risk you're taking. That is my choice. Oh, very well. Loderick, start checking motor and fuel. Yes, Saxon. So much for talking them into leaving the ship. Well, at least we got rid of one of them. Old Magnus. Oh, they'd have taken one of us anyway. It's just as well it's him. He's not so useful as a crew member. He knows that. Right, get the ship ready. I'll operate the airlock for Magnus and Treya. Saxon? Hearing you, Magnus. Safely aboard the alien ship, and you should see it. Extraordinary. You can tell us later. I certainly will. I've never seen anything like it. Treya wants to talk to you. Put her on. You will follow us. Keep close behind. No, no. This ship doesn't operate that way. I need to know the exact orbital angle to aim at. We can fire the motors only when we're in position. And when will that be? I can't say until I know the target position on the other side of Jupiter. If we will give you all that information. I see. Tell me precisely what you need to know. The exact position of your ship. Its orbital speed, 
and distance from the planet's surface. Computed. That was quick. What does it say? We reach Apogee in 25 minutes. Well, that's not long enough. We'll never be ready. You must. You have no choice. I'm telling you, we need to least... dispute with me. Begin work. 25 minutes Begin will not working be... or I fire. You can't threaten me. Roderick, do as they no, say. No, Saxon, they can't force me. But we can. Why, you... Roderick, Roderick, watch out, the gun. I'll get it. Careful, Chipper. No! What have you done to him? Stand back or I fire. No, Roderick, stay still. I'm not going to let... Roderick! Now you keep calm. What's happening here, Fire? They're attempting to attack me. You are hurt? No. They have little strength. I will report this to Silver Control. Say they are unarmed, but you dangerous. Are you all right, Chipper? <laughs> I think so. I bet my head on the televiewer. God, she packs a punch like a mule. Are you surprised? Seven feet tall and the physique to go with it. That was a stupid thing to do, Luddery. <sighs> Sorry, Saxon. Lucky for you, Chipper intervened. I got flung across the cabin for my trouble. Next time, I will shoot. Don't do anything like that again. I couldn't help it. She made me mad. Well... You can work off some of that aggression by getting the ship ready for orbit change. I'll check the motor and fuel supply. If what? Yes? I'll show you how to operate the safety straps and position your couch. No. I will take care of myself. But I... You are not to be trusted. Good try, Saxon. I wonder how Magnus is getting on on their ship. You can take your helmet off in here. The air is breathable. <clears throat> Thank you. Tell me, do all people where you come from have silver hair and silver skins? None of us has either. But you... The silver is sprayed on. It's a protection against radiation. Ah. Without it, the skin would discolor, even burn, and the hair and hands too. So what is the true color of your skin? It is much paler than yours. And your hair? Yellow. Yellow? I've never seen anyone with dark hair before, nor dark skin. Is the color applied by the wearer? Oh no, it's natural. A natural protection against sunlight. The rays from your sun are strong enough to do you harm. Not from here, they're not. The sun is nearly 500 million miles away. But on Earth, where we come from, it's only 93 million. You the rays come from the Jovian planetary system. No. Then who is Arecibo? Arecibo? Arecibo is an old radio telescope that used to operate down on Earth. But we came to Jupiter to find him. To Jupiter? Why? When we pinpointed the direction of the message, it was in this region of the sky. Jupiter is the largest body, so we traveled from our star system. You're from another star system? The nearest to this one. Alpha Centauri? We come from Corthea. Where? Corthea, the planet. It orbits the star you call Alpha Centauri. But, but that's more than four light years away. How long did it take? Wait. What's that? Wrist communication to Mothership. I have requested the information you require. She advises that the time taken to travel from our star system to yours was one twelfth of the Jupiter year. One twelfth? That's about one Earth year. One Earth year? To travel four and a half light years? Including acceleration and deceleration. Actual travel time could not be more than a few seconds. What? To break through the time barrier. Hello, Magnus. Space Force calling. Oh, hello, Space Force. Receiving you. We're about to fire the motors. Motors will fire in 20 seconds. Well, good luck. We'll keep an eye on you. Keep out of the way. 17. Could be 16. one almighty crash. Presumably, we also have to change orbit, Treya. Yes. Well, shouldn't we prepare for it? There is no need. But surely, when the motors fire and G increases... Acceleration is gentle. You'll hardly feel it. Then Space Force will pull away from us. Briefly. Ship accelerating. We shall overtake your ship in 15 minutes and arrive at the mothership in 19 hours. Slowly and gently, the little ship gathered pace and swept across the galaxy. After we had passed the Space Force, I spent the journey gazing through the televiewer, observing the terrifying faces of Jupiter's minor satellites. From the tiny, irregularly shaped Almathea, hardly more than a lump of rock, to the larger, smoother, shiny surface of Europa, covered by a layer of ice 60 miles thick, 
But the most terrifying sight was the close-up view of Io, whose orbit is so close to the planet. The interior of Io is constantly on the boil. There is hardly a moment when a colossal volcano is not spewing red-hot debris hundreds of miles above the satellite surface. By constantly ejecting its red-hot interior onto its own surface, Io is slowly turning itself inside out. I had totally lost myself in the contemplation of Jupiter's fiery and icy children when Treya tapped me on the shoulder. Look there, in the centre of the frame. That bright circle of light. That is our mothership. Bring her closer with the zoom control. It fills the whole screen. Bigger if you want. Is that a ship? A spaceship? A starship. It must be colossal. It is average for this type of vessel. We shall soon be there. How do you slow down? We have been doing so for some time. But I didn't see you do anything. We are completely under the mothership's control. We home in on her beam. She slows us down. She brings us into the landing dock. It is all automatic. Oh, that makes Space Force appear primitive. How will they slow down to enter the landing dock? Uh, oh, Saxon will handle it. Uh, with considerable help from the computer, of course. If we well, must not come to any harm. The starship was as tall as a skyscraper and as long as an ocean liner, its hull being round like a submarine's. Towering high above it was the superstructure, tall, almost as long as the hull, but only half its thickness. We entered smoothly, easily, and came to a halt at our mooring. After donning our helmets, we stepped out onto the mooring platform and crossed it, passing through the airlock we found ourselves inside the great ship. There we waited for Saxon and the rest of the Space Force crew. Saxon! Over here! What a ship! It's extraordinary. Large enough to accommodate a whole town. The technology of these people is beyond belief. How did Ifwa react to our primitive efforts? She didn't like it very much. Are they all here? Do you know where they are to be put? Great living area. It's not far. We can take the travel later. Keep close together. Do not attempt to get away. Follow the great corridor with a silver line. Where's that? Entrance over there. We start on the slow platform, change over to the faster one. How much further? We are close now. Who are the people we keep passing? Members of the starship crew. Why are they dressed in colored suits? The different colors indicate their trade. The colors of the corridors indicate the ship's area. What do these colors represent? In this area, mostly domestic. Gray, living quarters. The addition of silver indicates flying crews' living quarters. All flying personnel are dressed in silver? Yes. Treyer explained to me that... We are now in the gray living area. Enter third door on left. This is where you live. You will remain here until sent for. Where are you going? To the briefing room. And what happens to us? We must go. Well, surely you can tell us what's going on. Silence. May I ask one question? Yes. All the personnel we've seen aboard this starship appear to be women. Well, there are no men aboard this craft except you. You mean... You mean of all the thousands of crew on this ship, there's not one man? None. But how about back home, you know, where you come from? Of course I am. You must have men there. I have never seen any. But there are thousands of you. Come, Treya. Just a moment. If you need anything, ask Jenny. Who's Jenny? She has been appointed to look after you. You mean she's here in this apartment? All queries must be addressed to her. We will see you again. Hey, wait a minute. There's something else. Open up. I haven't finished. How do you get this door open? Did you see how they did it? It just slid open, apparently, of its own accord. I shouldn't think it's meant to open. Not for us. I suppose not. Uh, not to worry. We can ask Jenny. Treya said she was here. Where? Well, in this room, I suppose. The living quarters. Pretty sparse for living quarters. One room with four chairs in it. Are we supposed to sleep on these things? There's nowhere else that I can see. Here, yeah. what do you think all these different coloured buttons are? Why don't you press one and find out? Here goes, then. There. Oh. Well done, Chipper. 
Can you put the lights back on, please? Sorry. There. I'll try this one. What's that? You've opened another door to another room. It's a bedroom. Great area service. Oh. Huh. You made me jump. Can I help you? How did you get in here? You weren't there a second ago. And who are you? I'm Jenny. You called me. Me? You pressed the service button. Oh, well, uh, uh, I mean, I... Can you get us something to eat? Very well. I will fetch... Uh, wait, uh, and something to drink, too. Of course. Oh. She's gone. Most incredible thing I've ever seen. A real person appeared from nowhere. Largest life one moment, gone the next. How's it done? I wish I knew. Beautiful girl, too. Watch out, Saxon. What? What the... It's a table. What did you see where that came from? Well, it... It seemed to come out of the wall. Here comes the food. That was quick. <laughs> Looks delicious. Do you think we should try it? Well, it's either that or we starve. Right. I'll start. Hmm. Oh, it is delicious. Try it. Oh. Hmm. What a change after our rations. <laughs> this drink is good, too. Try some of this. Mm. What is it? I don't know. It's like pork. Really tasty. Of course, it may be some sort of centurion serpent. Mm -hmm. Do you think so? Pepper? You're not eating? No, I was thinking. What about that girl who came in here? What about her? So beautiful. Where did she come from? She appeared when you pressed that button. Just like Aladdin's genie. You press the button, she appears. Aren't you going to eat anything then, Pippa? Hmm? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll have a little bit of that, thanks. Well, anything Chipper doesn't want, I'll have. I've never tasted such good food. You summoned me? Yes. You would like the table removed? Yes. Stand clear. Is there anything else? Well, if you could tell us something about this place, we'd be... What do you wish to know? Well, what's likely to happen to us for a start? You will be examined and categorized. Mm -hmm. You will then be taken back to Corthia, or cast adrift, in your own vessel. How else did you expect to be treated? Like human beings. If your classification is high, you might be taken to Lochtan. What happens there? That is where all centurion males are banished to. Whatever for? To work. Work? As slaves. We well, can't be slaves. Well, just... Unless you are lucky enough to be classified in the primary category. Which is? Breeding. Centurion civilization may be all female, but it still has to reproduce. There are very few men lucky enough to be selected for that purpose. Lucky? Sounds like hard work to me. <laughs> oh, no. They lead a rich and easy life. Receive the best food, best living conditions. Sounds rather dull, then. Uh, excuse me, what are the chances of being selected as a breeder? <laughs> I do not get a mistaken impression of breeding. The chosen males are merely donors. Oh. There is no direct contact with any of the women. And what do you look for in a donor, then? Not me. The council. To be a breeder, a male must have a supremely high intelligence quota, good physique and disposition. Oh, I see. Do you think that we would... No, <laughs> it is unlikely. You do not even have the simple ability to communicate telepathically. Except you, Chipper. Hmm. And you can hardly be said to have physique. Oh, I don't know. What about his IQ? His examination will reveal that. And where does this... Where did she go? She just vanished again. I don't understand. How does she do it? Though Jenny appeared in our common room, looking like a real three-dimensional person, she was, in fact, nothing more than a projected image. 
Even so, she carried a charm and personality that conquered us all, but especially Chipper. Whenever she appeared, and he pressed the service button on the least excuse, he spoke to her gently and warmly. She also had a special tone of voice for him, which affected him deeply. Soon it was obvious that Chipper was falling in love with this apparition, and to our consternation, the apparition appeared to be encouraging him. Then one time, Jenny appeared without being called. You must all be ready for transfer to another part of the ship. Where are we going? To meet Voedica. Who's she? Commander of the starship. She wishes to see you, especially the Space Force leader. <laughs> it's about time I met somebody of my own rank and status. Remember, you were also her prisoner. <laughs> That's difficult to forget. And where does this Commander Voedica reside? On the far side of the starship. You will be escorted. Naturally. And remember, when you're interrogated... Interrogated? You... Yes. Remember, you must not... What? Another time. Here comes your escort. Be humble and respectful before Voedica. Yes, but what we Come with us! Now! Okay. Very well. Okay. Good luck. We were taken through a number of moving corridors and carried upwards in the general direction of the front end of the ship. We must have climbed to about half the height of the superstructure when we reached the outer door of an airlock. We passed through and found ourselves in a huge chamber, the nerve center of the starship, its very brain. On a raised platform to one side sat a woman. Like all the Centaurian women, she was very tall, but appeared considerably older than any we had seen up to now. This was Voedica. Tell the Jovians to sit down. They are not Jovians, Highness. They are from Earth. Which is their commander? I am. Commander Saxon Berry. Is what you see on the screen the planet you hail from? Yes, it is. A remarkable picture. It's three-dimensional. How can they achieve such an incredibly close-up view? Is that where the Arecibo message came from? Yes. We thought it came from Jupiter. No. Earth. Earth is such a tiny planet. We thought it too small to be of any significance. It's a world full of life. And it must be the only one in this whole system that is. More than likely. How disappointing. Those little unmanned ships that have been flying around Jupiter. Are they from Earth, too? Yes. Sent here to investigate your radio signals. But they all died. That was our doing. We rendered their equipment useless. You did that to our ship, too. The Space Force. Why? We did not expect to find anybody at all. But life is what we came looking for. So we are glad to have found you. And now that you have us, what do you intend to do with us? That depends on the result of your interrogation. We were you. told... What is your name? Huh? Me? Of course. Oh, uh, Chipper. Chipper Barney. Take him down to interrogation. Return the others to their quarters. Yes, sir. Oh, no. Saxon! Wait a minute. If one goes, we all go. Take him away. Very well. Come, no. on, come with us. Let go of him! Let's help! Break. Help him! You better stand, stand back! Stand back or we fire. Get the gun! Oh! Ah! Ah! What have you done? You've killed them. Disobedience will not be tolerated. Wake up. Oh. You're not hurt. Oh. Wake up. What happened? You have slept, that is all. Slept? I was shot. You received a blast from an anesthetizing gun. Oh. You're not hurt, are you? No, no, I, I feel fine, I think. How about you, Magnus? Uh, oh, I, I'm all right. And me. Oh, good. Hey. Where's Chipper? He has been taken to Group A Medical Center. What are you going to do to him? And and why Chipper? Take these Earthmen to why Group Chipper? A Medical Center. Very good, Boy. That's not where they took Chipper. 
take them now. But we can't let them separate hold us. It, hold yes, it. but we can't. Hold it. Those guns might as well walk as be carried. We'll go quietly for the present. Hmm. Are you awake now? Where am I? In the medical section. A second ago, I was in the ship's control center. How do you feel? Like I've just woken up from a deep, beautiful sleep. You must lie perfectly still. Why? What have they done to me? We have tested your physical and mental fitness. Relax. How did I do? Do. In the tests? The results have not been computerized yet. <laughs> yes, but you can I sure... I am not allowed to discuss tests with patients. I'm not asking much. Only will I live. Somebody else will be along to see you soon. Do not attempt to get up. If you need anything, press the button. You understand. I suppose so. I mean... Oh. She's gone. I don't feel ill. I wonder what they're doing to me. Oh. Hello, Chipper. Jenny. Where did you come from? You called me. The button, you mean? Yes. If I'd known it would be you, I'd have pressed it sooner. I'm glad. Is there something I can get you? Like what? A drink? Some food? Oh, no, thank you. I'd just like a talk. Very well. Funny you should appear. I was dreaming about you just before I woke up. Ah, oh, yes. You would. I would? How do you know? Far too complicated for me to explain. Don't let it stop you. We have much nicer things to talk about. Such as? The time when we shall meet face to face. There's no viewing screen between us. I see no screen. I'm nothing more than a three-dimensional projection. You look solid enough to me. Like I could touch you. No. Your hand would pass right through. Oh. But one day we will meet. Where? When? When you have been cleared physically and psychologically. When you are free to move around the ship. What part of the ship do you live in? Blue section. Communications. Is that far? From here it is, but not from your living quarters. It's quite close to the docking area. As soon as I get off this bed, I'll come and see you. No. That would be dangerous. Why? You have not been cleared. Of what? When your tests have been assessed and your category finalized, you may be allowed to come. And if not? Then I will find some way of coming to see you. Oh, don't be too long about it. I'm dying to see you, yourself, as you really are. Your escort is coming. Hmm? Trey and Ifwa. They will take you back to your living quarters. When shall I see you again? Goodbye. No, wait. Jenny? Jenny. How much further, Trey? Your quarters are just past the blue section, near the docking area. Blue section? Communications? Yes. There are the blue guidelines on the walls. We pass Blue Junction in just a moment. That's where Jenny is. We're coming to the junction now. That's it, there. I've got to see her. I've got to see her. Stop! She's in trail. No, I've got to! Hold him! Let go, do you hear? Let go! What is the trouble with the blue junction? Alarm situation resolved. No emergency. Where were you going? You said that was the way to communications. That's right. I was going to find Jenny. Not in blue section. It is forbidden. Who says so? It is the rule. No unauthorized persons allowed. Come. We will return you to grey section. Yeah. Oh! You're hurting my wrist. Let go. You cannot be trusted. No need for you to grab me as well. Oh! Why don't you pick on someone your own size? Here he is, at last. Chipper, you all right? Yeah, I'm all right. You don't sound it. What happened to you? I had a medical, that's all. What did they do? I don't know, I was asleep. We were tested as well, but yours seems to have taken much longer. They're trying to decide which one of us is the most able specimen. Survival of the fittest, Ifwa said. Survival? Yeah. And what happens to the others? Not so fit. She didn't say. They don't survive. It's obvious they'll be killed. Listen, all of you. I don't know what they're up to or what they aim to do with us if we fail the test. But one thing is clear. We must stick together. Resist separation at all costs. Plan a way to get back to our own ship and get away. Escape? From here? Yes. Impossible. 
I'm sure everything we do is being monitored. They're probably listening to us now. Even so, we And even if we did get back to the ship, we'd never get clear. Why not? They'd kill us stone dead before we fired the motors, just as they did before they boarded us. But we can't just give up, Magnus. Why not? Why shouldn't we stay? It's a fascinating experience. Scientifically, I'm discovering something new all the time. Until one day you discover you've been shot. That is highly unlikely. What do you think, Chipper? I support Magnus. Make the best of it. See what happens. What's got into you? Two? You wanted my opinion. I gave it to you. If you insist on trying to escape, I'll help you. But against my better judgment. And what about you, Chipper? I want to stay. You can't mean that. Hold it, Saxon. We've got company. Jenny. I'm sorry to disturb you. The commander wishes to address you. Please watch the screen. I don't see any screen. In front of me. Good day, Earthman. Ah. Jenny, you may leave. Now, Earthman, I have come to tell you the results of your tests. The fittest man in your crew is Radio Officer Barnett. Blimey. The fact that he can communicate telepathically places him way above the rest of you. A person who cannot communicate in this way is of little consequence in our society. Magnus has some potential in this direction, but it is undeveloped. I see. So, what's going to happen? Barnett will come back with us to Corfea. And the rest of us? The rest of you. The rest of you will be allowed to leave. You may return to your planet, if you can. But without Chipper? Barnet goes with us. And if we refuse to leave him? You will die. I see. We accept your terms, Boedica. What? You are wise to do so. But we need time. Time? A time with Chipper. After all, we'll never see him again. Very well. You have ten minutes. What? Is that all? This ship will take off in one hour. If you are not in a docking area by that time, your craft will be unable to leave. An hour? But it only takes 15 minutes to reach the docking area. Not during takeoff procedures. All power is required for charging the engines, so all walkways are inoperative and airlocks must be controlled manually. You have 10 minutes, Earthmen. Summon Jenny when you are ready to move. Farewell. Ship preparing for blast off. All personnel not involved in preparation to return to their quarters. Firing at zero miles. Don't waste any time. We can't waste any either. And we've got to find some way of taking Chipper with us. I thought you accepted her terms. It was just to buy time. Right. Any ideas? Don't trouble yourself. I'm not coming. Talk sense, Chipper. I prefer to stay. What for? For Jenny. A picture on a teleview. She's not just a picture, not her true self. How do you know? She told me. Soon we're going to meet face to face. You must be crazy. Don't you know what's happening? It's obvious what's happening. He's fallen in love with her. With an apparition. She's not an apparition. She's as solid as you are. Have you ever been able to touch her? Feel her breath on your cheek? No, not yet, but I will. She's having you on. Hmm? She's made you fall in love with her. It's all part of the great Centaurian plot to have you stay here. To take you back to Corthea to enslave you. Rubbish. She'd never do a thing like that, would she, Magnus? I must say I find the girl rather delightful. <sighs> That's it. What's it? You're both being brainwashed. Brainwashed? Who? By? By Jenny, Ifwa, Treya, Voedica, everybody aboard this ship. But how? Telepathy. Slowly but surely, they're feeding you with thoughts and desires that make you want to stay here. I've said I will come with you if necessary. Yes, that's because you're only partially affected, because your telepathy is undeveloped. But Chipper, he's had the full works from the word go. We've got to get away before they start getting us, Saxon. Oh, no, we're not the types. We've got to make sure Chipper and Magnus come with us. I'm not coming. We can't man the ship without you. Firing time zero minus 50 minutes. 50 minutes. All that... non-essential personnel to return to living quarters at once. Ah, well, at least there won't be many people about to stop us. Uh, call up Jenny, Ludrick. Right. Yes? We're ready to go. Good. An escort is on its way from Red Section to collect Chipper and take him to his new quarters. Thanks, Jenny. And does this mean I'll see you soon? Pro properly, I mean. Very soon. What about our pressure suits? We can't leave without them. They will be in the main lock, leading to the docking area. And helmets? They'll be there. All chief personnel to control room. All chief personnel going. to control room. Right. We've got to deal with Chipper's escort. 
from red section, she said. That means they'll be armed with those anesthetizing guns. That's right. How many do we? Probably two. Uh, we'll need your help, Magnus. What do I have to do? Lodric and I will wait behind the door. We'll take them as they come in. You grab the gun and shoot them. Shoot them? I'm not sure I could shoot a woman. They're not women. They're aliens, Magnus. Don't make them influence you. I can't do You'll this. You'll only they're, knock them out. Coming, Will you help us, please? Very well. Don't ask me to have anything to do with it. You stay where you are and keep quiet. All right, Lodric. Get behind the door. Right. Barnet, we're here to bring now. you. Now! What are you doing? Stand back! Get that gun, Magnus! Come on, Magnus! Good work, Lodric. Thanks. And you, Magnus. How long will they be unconscious? I don't know. We'd better get started. Come on, Shepard. I'm not coming, I told you. You're coming, whether you like it or not. Jenny will help me. Grab him, Lodric. Right. Don't stop him reaching the button. Let me go, let me go. Use that anesthetic gun on me if you need to. Right. Right. Come on. Come on, Jimmy. All non-essential personnel to leave now. quarters immediately. Are you coming quietly, Chipper, or do we need to use the gun? No, you don't. Good. Let's go. Minus 30 minutes. Great section personnel escorting alien Barnet. Return him to his living quarters. Keep up, Chipper. Okay, okay. So far, so good. Oh, they said they'd let us leave. Until they discover we have Chipper with us. Well, that can't be for a few minutes yet. How much further? We're just coming up to Blue and Silver Junction. Docking area is a couple of minutes from there. Blue Junction? That's Jim. Chipper, come back! Stop him, Lodric. Use the gun! Oh, I missed! I'll get after him. We'll come with you. No, no, go to the dock. Open the fast airlock. Save time. Where do you need help? I'll manage, even if I have to carry him. I'll go with him, Lodric. See you at the dock. Right. Which way did he go? Can't be far ahead. Never passed any other junction. No doors he could have disappeared into. What about that one? With a blue circle on it. That must be the communication control center. Where Jenny lives. That's where he'll be. Come on. Not a soul about. They've all gone to ground because of the blast off. We'll never find him in here. It's like a maze. Stop a minute. Hmm? Listen. Jenny! Ah, that's him. Yes. But where is he? His voice seems to come from all around Jenny! us. Jenny! Jenny, where are you? Jenny? Jenny, where are you? You in here, Jenny? Hello, Chipper. Oh. How did you get here? I followed the blue signs. It is forbidden for unauthorized personnel to enter the communication section. You could get into serious trouble. Who with? There's nobody here. You are lucky. They've all gone to their quarters for the takeoff. It is dangerous to be about while the motors are charging. Only emergency power is available. Where are you? I can hear you, but I can't see you. There is no screen where you are. Walk on a few yards between the control stacks. Yes, doing that. And you come to a blue door with lighter blue zigzag lines on it. I see it. That is the door to my room. You may come in. Where are you? Here, right in front of you. All I can see is a computer console. That is me. No, it's not true. I've seen you. You're beautiful. That is only my image. Look. Oh, there you are. No. Try and touch me. You can't. But you let me believe you were real. That was your idea. I never suggested it. And that I would see you in your quarters. That is just where you are. In the special computer suite. But you made me fall in love with you. No. My program did that. Why? To persuade you to come back to Corthea. And then when it was too late for me to go back, I'd find out you were not real. Before then, the desensitizing process would have begun. The what? The process by which you would be made to fall out of love with me. Nothing would have done that. Look, Chipper. Chipper! Look at Chipper. my face. Oh, well, no. I'd make myself even uglier. No. 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 Stop it. Chipper, where are you? Now can you know me? No! <laughs> Chipper! Good heavens, what's that? Looks like Jenny. What's happened to her? Jenny, can you hear me? She doesn't move. Something's gone wrong with her picture. I did it. What? I smashed the screen. I was trying to smash her face in. You know she's not real then. Yes. She was manipulating me. And then those faces. 
She was tormenting me. I, I wanted... This is no place for you, Chipper. People created by computers, mind-washing by telepathy. You're best out of it. We all are. Come on. Let's get back to our own ship and go home. Here, let me help you up. Come on. Thanks, Saxon. Now, back to the passage or we'll never get to the dock area in time. You know, she was the most beautiful girl I've ever seen. She would be. She was specially created for you. There's a dock, and there's Roderick. Ah. He's got the first lock open already. Thank goodness nobody's chasing us. Keep up, Chipper. I'm trying to. Good to see you. I thought you'd never make it. Pressure suits there? Yes. Now get inside, all of you. Put them on. But only three. What? Chippers isn't here. They didn't leave it. But he can't leave without it. We have to cross ten yards of airless space before we reach our ship. Exactly. That leaves us no choice. Huh? One of us will have to stay behind. Not on your life. What are we going to do? We'll... We'll have to share a suit. Share? Mm. One of us stays here, the other three go through the lock, get aboard the ship. Then one of the three comes back with a spare suit. Good idea. I'll wait behind. You go. You sure? Of course. They may get hold of him before we can get back. I know that. Just go. Okay. Here's the gun, Magnus. If anybody comes after you, at least you'll have a chance of knocking him out. Thank you. If I don't see you again, good luck. You'll see us again. Lodrick, close the door. Let's get through this lock and onto the ship. Zero minus 15 minutes. Repeat. Zero minus... Ah, it's good to be back in Space Force. Lodrick, get your suit off. Doing it. Chipper, get to the radio. Monitor the Starship's intercom. Right. And while I'm gone, Lodrick, inspect the motors and estimate the fuel situation. You've got less than 15 minutes. I know. We'll see what we can do. Here, the helmet. Thanks. Now, close the door, pump the air out, and keep your fingers crossed. Good luck. Magnus. Magnus. Yes, Saxon. Oh, I thought I'd lost you. Come in here. Right. Uh, get this suit on. Let me know as soon as you're airtight. Well, I mean, power supply still seems to be operating. They don't go over to emergency power until just before the motors fire. Right. How's that? Sounds okay. Pump the air out. One more operation and we're home and dry. Why haven't they sent somebody for us? Oh, they're too busy preparing for blast-off. They could have postponed it. They can't. The process can't be reversed. Hey, this air pump's taking its time. Should have done the job by now. Uh, this is still working. Yes, but so slowly. Ah, at last. Open the door and let's get out of here. It's stuck. And the lights are dimmed. Well, they must have gone over to emergency power. That means there's none to spare for the airlocks. The door's half open. Perhaps we could squeeze through. No, we'd never make it. Not in inflated suits. Then we're trapped. Looks like it. And with the starship about to blast off in less than ten minutes. We can't just give up, Magnus. Not now. But there's nothing we can do. There must be something. Perhaps we could... Yes, that's it. We've got to remove our life support packs. We can carry them. But that'll cut off our oxygen supply. Right. Then we let out the air. What? When the suits have deflated enough, we can squeeze through the door. With virtually no air supply. Enough to get us aboard Space Force if we hurry. And death from suffocation if we don't. So we must move fast. Now, start letting out the air. Are you hearing all this, Roderick? Yes. Is the lock prepared? Doors open. Come on then, Magnus. Ship's motors will fire in five minutes. Five minutes. All personnel to stay under cover until further notice. Are you all right, Magnus? Yes, I think so. Into the lock, then, quick. Okay, Lodric, we're in. Closing the door. You can expect to be with us now. Uh, uh, Magnus! Uh, Magnus! What is it? He's passed out. Airlock filling. I'll reconnect his life support. If I can just... Uh, what about your own? I'll, I'll 
do that next. Airlock fitting. Ten seconds to go. I, I can't. I can't manage. Hold on, Saxon. Five seconds. Four. Three. Two. Uh, one. Door open. Saxon, are you all right? Chipper, help me get his helmet off. Coming. There. Saxon. Saxon. I, I didn't think I'd make it. Couldn't make my connector work. How's Magnus? I'm all right now. I think I must have passed out. You did. Close the lock. We've got less than four minutes to get away from the dock area and out into space. Right. Prepare to fire thrusters. Already prepared. Good. Fire. Pulling away. Starships will just fire in three minutes. Their radio swamps everything. Three minutes to go. We'll never make it. We'll be swamped by the electronic wash. What's its motive power? No idea. Could it be atomic? I hope not. There'd be nothing left of us if it is. We're free of the dock area, drifting out slowly. Yeah, too slowly. Everybody strapped in? Yes, yes. yes. I stand by for countdown to motor firing. Hello, Chipper. Chipper, can you hear me? Hmm? Who's that? Who's what? Somebody's calling me. Don't answer. What are you doing out there? We need you on the starship. What? Do you? Chipper, ignore them. Distance from starship approximately 600 yards. The stern of that ship, it's glowing white hot. Firing time, two minutes. Stand by. Space Force firing in ten seconds. Nine, you eight, have time, seven, Just six, to the five, four, three, two, I'd like to, but two, I can't get up not till one, our motors are fired. Zero. We're off. I think we're just in time. Speed, four thousand. Four thousand, five hundred. Check the television and see what's happening, right? Chipper. Chipper. I'm listening. Ludwig, look after Chipper. I don't believe it. They're coming after us. What? One of their small craft there on the screen. They haven't time. Their own ship's about to take off. But the initial acceleration is very slow. Treyer told me that. Space Force. Oh. Yes, a ship is on its way to you. We can see it. Put on a suit, Chipper, into the airlock and wait for us to pick you up. I'm going with them. You're coming back to Earth with us. Starship's motor firing in ten seconds. We must get back on board the Starship before the critical acceleration time. What's that? Coming over the radio. It must be the Starship's motors. That light from the ship's stern is so bright. Some kind of ray or particle propulsion. You must do as we say. You'll have to obey them, Saxon. Have they started brainwashing you again? You can't refuse them. You have ten seconds, Space Force. But let me go. Why? They haven't got time to do anything. Five seconds. I'm coming, Jib. I'm coming. You're holding. Keep him away from the airlock. Oh, no. Let me go. Space Force, your time is up. everybody. Magnus. Saxon. Saxon. Oh, better get up if I can move. Oh. Is that you, Lodry? Yes. You all right? Oh, banged my head on the televiewer. I think I banged more than my head. What happened? Yeah, they wanted you to go with them. Did they? I, I don't remember. Then they must have started shooting at us. Ray guns or something. Is that what it was? Oh, I thought the ship would break up. Where are the others? I don't know. Shipper, Some... we're here. There. There they are, behind the computer. Oh, good. How's Magnus? He's just coming round. He's... okay. Right, first thing we do is examine the ship from bow to stern. Try to get a few things working. It's not completely dead. We've got the emergency lighting. And gravity for some reason. Yes, it's very weak, though. Hardly enough to keep our feet on the floor. So, what do we do? You come with me, Lodrick. Right. Let's try and restore the power supply. What about me? Try to get the electronics working. Televiewer first, then the radio, then the computer. If we could get the door to the observation dome working, we could see out. Yeah, we need a lot of power for that, maybe more than we've got. Magnus, you stay with Chipper. Mm. If we need you, we'll call you. Right. Come on, Lodrick. The first thing to look at is the thermoelectric generators.
Shipper seems more his old self, Saxon. Yes. Seems to have forgotten all about Jenny and the other Centaurians, thank goodness. Mm. Do you think they could still come after us, try and get him? It's possible, if they discover they haven't destroyed us. With technology that advanced, they could do anything. Mm. Saxon? Yes? What's the verdict on the generators? Uh, one of them is totally out of action. Never for repair? No. They're the one thing we can't tamper with. Too much danger from radiation. I hope there's none leaking out. Yeah, we checked that. So where does that leave us? With only half the electrical power we need, I'm afraid. Which means we can run the radio, the televiewer, the computer, all the software, provided they're not damaged. What about airlocks? Not enough power for that. Then we can never open the door. Never get out? Nope. I could open the observation lock by hand. That's all. I see. We've just got to hope we can get the radio operating. Then we can contact Earth and get some help. <sighs> there we are, then. Transmitter and receiver both working. Quite a lot of current in the old aerial. Enough for Earth to hear us. That remains to be seen. 400 million miles is a long way, especially on half power. We may not be that far. Depends how long we were all unconscious and how fast we've been travelling. We couldn't have covered more than a million miles, though. No. So any message we send will take up to 35 minutes to reach Earth, another 35 back. At least. Right. Switch on, Chipper. I'll try to contact Control. Okay. And while I'm doing that, see if the televiewer is working. That's it. That's good. A tiny little more. How's that? Should be all right now. I'll switch on. Still the same, nothing but coloured streets. Perhaps the screen's damaged. I don't think we'd see anything if it was. What puzzles me is the way those lines are moving. Hey, what was that light? I've never seen a televiewer behave like this before. You sure you've connected it upright? Of course I have. You getting a clear picture yet, Chip? Not up to now. I've checked everything. Oh, let's have a look at it then. There's that light again. It's just hundreds of coloured lines. All distorted. No picture at all. But that is a picture. Huh? Those aren't lines of distortion, they're star trails. What? Pictures of stars crossing the screen at such high speed, they appear as lines. But how can they move like that? They're not. We are. The ship's tumbling head over heels. And not just tumbling, it's slowly rotating as well. That's why we can feel a little gravity. Of course. But we can't establish our position unless we can stabilize the ship. Loderick. Yes? How much fuel do we have left? The computer said we had just enough to get on course for home. That was for the main motors. What about the thrusters? They were still functioning when we left the starship's dock, but there can't be much left in them. Well, go down and check. We might at least be able to steady this tumbling. seconds more. What's happened? Sorry, Saxon. No more fuel. We'll just maintain a slow tumble from now on. And we're still rotating. Yes, we can allow for that. It's far better than it was. Let's get back to work. Lodry, start on the observation dome lock. Open it by hand. Yes. Chipper, try to get the computer going. Magnus will help you. Right. I'll try to locate position and speed with the aid of the televiewer. I don't understand this. If only I could use the computer. Sorry, Saxon, it won't function. Or even a reply from Earth. If they were receiving us, we'd have got a reply by now. Isn't the televiewer working? Forward one is, the navigation screen. But it doesn't make sense. Why? With two large sighting objects, such as the Earth and Jupiter, it should be possible to obtain a fix and estimate our position and speed. So? I can't find Jupiter. What? No sign of it. But it's image should be colossal. It's not there. Perhaps we're going backwards. You know, instead of heading earthwards, we're heading out of the solar system and Jupiter's behind us. We'd still see it. The televiewer can't cover 360 degrees. But we're still tumbling, so we can scan the whole sky. How could a whole planet, one bigger than all the rest of the sun's planets put together, just disappear? You tell me. It's impossible. And what about that bright light that kept flashing across the screen when we were tumbling? It's a star. It sounds ridiculous, but it looks like the sun. That is ridiculous. The sun must be over 450 million miles away. I know. Chipper. Yes, Saxon. Get on the radio. Give Control another call. It's only an hour since you sent the last one. I'll keep calling every hour on the hour. 
Wherever we are, they're our only hope. Okay. Is the electronic log working? I should think so. Why? In case we don't survive, I'd like to make a record of the expedition. If the Space Force is ever picked up, I'd like people to know what happened to us. Log entry number 726. This is the story of a journey among the stars. An intergalactic adventure so astounding that even now, as the great trauma draws to its close, I find it difficult to believe it actually happened. But the evidence is there. What we have all been through was no bad dream, nor the figment of some crazy imagination. Even now, we cannot survive, except by the intervention of a miracle. Chipper. Yeah? Time to send another message. Okay. I think I might do better listening out in the headphones. It might be a weak response. All right. If I get a reply, I'll put it through the intercom circuit straight away. Good. Yeah. Switch off the amplifiers, that saves a little power. And plug in the phones. Mm -hmm. That's on. Shouldn't sound like that. Oh well, nothing's working properly on this ship. Might as well start calling. Hello, this is Chipper Barnett aboard Space Force. Can you hear me? I repeat, this Hello? is Chipper Barnett aboard. Hey? Who's that? Is that Chipper? Yes. Who are you? I heard your call for help. But who are you? You do need help, don't you? Who are you? I'm Jenny. Oh, no. That is Chipper, isn't it? Go away. But I want to help. Go away. We don't need any help. Chipper, who are you talking to? But you said you were desperate. We're not that desperate. Go away. Chipper. We don't need you. Go away. Chipper. Here, give me those phones. Hello, hello. This is Commander Saxon Berry aboard the Space Force. Come in, please. Come in, please. We need to hear from you. Hello, hello. Ah, there's nobody there. Yes, there is. Are you sure you're not hearing voices again? Yes. You're certain? Yes, yes, I am. Who was it then? <sighs> Jenny. Jenny? What's going on? He says he heard Jenny calling. She came up on the radio, answered my distress call. No, you couldn't have heard her, Chipper. You destroyed her back on the starship, don't you remember? And when Saxon found you in the blue section. Jenny, did he say? No one else heard her, only him. But he was wearing headphones. I put them on. I didn't hear anybody. She was there, large as life. She knew me. Well, then she'll most likely come up again, so keep listening. Yes, but I... But not on the headphones. We all want to hear. Put your receiver through the intercom. If you say so. I do. Now, back to work. Hey, Ludrick, what's that? My telescope, the 18th century Cassegrainian. You aiming to use it in the dome? Why not? Might enable us to identify something, help establish where we are. Well, good for you. But don't go looking at that bright star. You'll blind yourself. I need assistance urgently. That is the end of the message. This message will be repeated in one hour. No luck then, Chipper? No, nah, not a whisper. Uh, Jenny never called again? You would have heard her if she had. The circuit's plugged into the intercom. You'd all hear her. I doubt it. You don't believe Now, me. don't get upset. We're under great strain. It's bound to have a bad effect on all of us, some more than others. Saxon, quick! You've seen something? Yes, but I can hardly believe it. What is it? Jupiter! What? Yes! But I've been scanning everywhere on the televiewer. There's been no sign of it. Come to the observation dome. See for yourself. There. Nothing but stars, millions of them. Now, that's the background. Look in the telescope. You're right. It is Jupiter. Moons as well. Or some planet very like it. There isn't another like it. Not in this solar system. Can you see it? Yes, but it's millions of miles away. About 400 million in my estimation. We can't possibly have traveled that far. We must have. But where are we? More important, how did we get here? For some inexplicable reason, we are hundreds of millions of miles off course, and we must have traveled that distance in just an hour or two. Hello, Space Force. Calling uh, space radio, force. quick, we've made contact. Wait. Calling Space Force. Come on, Chipper, answer her. Yes, we all can. Go on, reply. We'll come down. Space Force calling. Receiving you loud and clear. Is that Chipper? 
Chipper Barnett? Yes. Who are you? I'm Jenny. You remember me, don't you? Will I ever forget you? Last time I called you, you told me to go away and not to bother you. No, that's right. But you were in distress. You needed help. We all are. There's more than one of you? You know that. How should I know? After all you did to us, and to me in particular. Me? I've never met you. Move over, Chipper. I'll talk to her. You're welcome. Listen, are you Jenny? Yes, I am. Then you know who we are and probably where we are. You're the only one that does. Me? Are you programmed to torment us? Programmed? What do you think I am? A computer? We know you are. You must be crazy. Not as crazy as we'd be to accept your help. Quiet, Chipper. Now, don't you try to fool us. You're from the Centaurian starship. The what? Now on its way to Corthea. Corthea? Centaurian? I don't think that comes in our area. The farthest we serve is Brighton. Brighton? Yes. It's a place about 50 miles from London. Greatest speed in all comforts. Trips to the continent by special arrangement and a small extra charge. What are you talking about? Morgan's private air bus service. Private air bus? The commuter's friend. Why go by public transport if we can drop you in your own back garden? You must have seen the ads. Listen. Yes? Is your name Jenny or isn't it? How many more times? Yes, it is. Then how can you hear our calls when nobody else can? Can't they? If they could, they'd have replied. I don't know about that. All I know is here I am trying to work, and every hour or so I find it's impossible because I'm swamped by calls from some bloke calling himself Chipper Barnett. What work do you do exactly? I'm the radio telephonist in the control room of Morgan's private air buses. I see. And you really want to help us? If you want me to. And listen carefully, I shall give you a telephone number to ring. When you get a reply, ask to speak to Space Force Control. Yes. Tell them the frequency you're working on and ask them to call us. Is that all? Yes. Will you do it? Yes. And tell us when you've done it and let us know what they say. Will you keep listening? Of course. Very well. I'll call you later. Thank you. Not at all. It's all a trick. She'll never call back. You still think it's Jenny the computer? Who else? They're going to keep tormenting us right to the end. What do you think, Magnus? I think she's genuine. She's certainly not very far away. There was no delay between transmission and reply. All the more reason for her to be the computerized Jenny. No call of ours could reach Earth in such a short time. Unless we were close to Earth without knowing it. But we're millions of miles away. Not judging by the view we get of Jupiter. That wash that swamped us when the Centaurians took off, and those rays the ship fired at us. Well? I thought they intended to blow us to pieces. So did I. But they didn't succeed. Instead... They forced our ship into an incredibly high rate of acceleration. So high that it finally broke through the time barrier. No, no, it's a, that's too fantastic. Is it? Then what about Jupiter? Why does it appear the same size and when viewed from Earth? You actually think we're back in the Earth system? Yes. I think we are. Hello, Space Force. She's back. Come on. He Hello, yes. Commander Berry here. I did what you said. And? Well, such commotion. You're to keep listening on this frequency until they contact you. How long will that be? Now, come in, Space Force. <sighs> Commander Berry speaking. This is Space Force Control. It is, then. How oh, we pleased to hear from you. What are you doing calling us on a commercial frequency band? Chipper. I don't know. The transmitter must have drifted off. Well, and how is it you've come back early? What? You're not due back for another 12 and a half months. Didn't you get to Jupiter? Of course we did. You received our radio messages, didn't you? Yes. But if they were genuine, you should hardly have started your return journey yet, let alone finished it. It's a, a long story. Right now, we're in need of rescue. Um, most of the ship is out of action, and we only have enough air for four more weeks. Can you help us? Of course. We have pinpointed your position. We'll have a life vessel out to you in three days. Is that all? Then where are we? About 500,000 miles above the Earth. Then why haven't we seen it? Probably because it lies directly between you and the Sun. You'd never see it, not without filters. Ah, ours aren't functioning. We have commandeered this frequency, so keep listening out. We'll contact you again soon. Of course. Keep watch, Chipper. Sure. Whew. Do you think they're going to believe it all, Magnus, when we tell them? I doubt it. I doubt it very much. Hello, Space Force. Oh, hello. Chipper Barnett calling. Hello, Chipper. I have a message for you from Control. Go ahead, listening. 
In 10 minutes time, control will be transmitting a signal on red frequency. You'll have to tune your transmitter to it. But don't close this frequency until ordered. Oh. That means I can talk to you a bit longer. Oh, yes. I suppose it does. Your name really is Jenny, then? Of course it is. Jenny Campbell. And, um... Is there a Mr. Campbell? Yes. Why do you ask? Oh. Oh, I just wondered. He's my father. Oh, I see. Um, in that case, I wonder, would you like to have dinner with me? You know, when, when I get back to Earth, get both feet on the ground. Why me? Well, I'd like to thank you for helping us. Besides, I like your name, Jenny. Do you? Oh, yes. It's my favourite. How about it? OK. Call me on the video phone when you get back. Morgan's private air buses. It's in the book. Oh, I will. Goodbye for now, then. Goodbye, Jenny.